Good morning. Welcome to Leave Your Ego at the Door. I hope you left your ego and not your sweater at the door because it is a freezer in here um, and likely to stay that way, I'm afraid. But my name is Carrie Staten, you might be downstairs. Um, I'm excited to introduce this panel of folks who are doing really great work um, with assessment grants across um, the Northern pan 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 Handle of West Virginia, Ohio, and North Carolina. So we have another truly regional panel today um, and I'm gonna let them do the bulk of introducing themselves that while I am their Vanna, but we have with us today, Mike Pepperocki with the Brooke Hancock Jefferson Metropolitan Planning Organization. Did I get it? Commission. That's close. Commission. It works. I got that. Marvin Six with the Business Development Corporation of the Northern Panhandle. Natalie Hamilton with Bellamar and Jesse Day with the North Carolina Piedmont Triad Regional Council. Yes. All right. So they're going to tell us about some work that they've been doing, how they're uh, implementing coalitions, not as a single person, but as a part of a team and how that can help maximize your capacity and, and your impact. And so they're gonna chat for a little bit and then I have some questions for them. I hope you have some questions for them and that we can have a discussion. Maybe we'll do some jumping jacks to warm up if we need to. Um, but with that, I'll hand it over to Mike to kick us off. Thank you. I guess the best way that I can come up with an analogy for a coalition is just think of your body parts because everything works independently of each other. You know, you have a hand, right hand, left hand. Did I do that right? Right hand, left hand. No, I did no. it wrong. Right hand, left hand. But I'm dominated by my right hand. So what do I do with my left hand? Do I ignore it or do I use it? And that's kind of like a part of a coalition. You know, sometimes, you know, you get things worn out. So you have to use the other body part. So the way we started with the coalition is, you know, way back in 2003. Okay. Uh, the Brook and Hancock, we're part of the regional council. The Brook and Hancock are the two uppermost counties in West Virginia. If you know where Chester, West Virginia is, that's where Fiesta Ware is in, in Newell, West Virginia. That's the top of West Virginia. That's the, that's the theme for Hancock County. And my former executive director applied for two, co uh, two community assessment grants. They were small pilot grants, $200,000 each. That's about 10 times $20,000. And then, Jefferson County, which is across the river, applied for, at the time, it was a million dollar coalition grant. But there were no connection between Brook and Hancock and Jefferson County. So we kind of floundered for a few years, you know, and, and the task forces that we were working with were primarily elected officials and public administrators. And if you know a lot about of elected officials, they come and go, or they seem to be very parochial in their projects. And it's always, and that, you know, some of the questions that I get is that what's in it for me or what's in it for you? And you get the same a lot with public administrators because these are the folks that are elected to represent a certain group of individuals. So it, 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 it's very difficult to, to overcome, you know, some of, you know, what goes on. So, you know, we can describe that as, as a reluctance to cooperate. And if you look at the, at the small print at the title, we're three counties, two states, two EPA regions, Ohio's in region five, West Virginia's in region three, but we're one metropolitan area and it's the same with Natalie. You know, it's, it's basically the same thing. And, but we're divided by this Ohio river and very little things join us together. One is industry, economic development, and also bridges. That's what makes us one metropolitan area, but you have reluctance to cooperate. You have skepticism. You have like minimal capacity to do things, uh, resources, 
financial resources. In Ohio, we're a home rule state, so we can tax ourselves as much as we want in the state of Ohio at the local level. But what happens in West Virginia, your cash stream depends on Charleston. Okay, and I'm sure a lot of you are aware of that. Site control also becomes an issue. When we started doing a lot of these projects, we were just doing phase ones. We're just doing phase ones for the sake of, gee, we got some money we got to spend. We got a million dollars. We got $200,000. We got to spend it. Were we taking up an inventory? Well, it was kind of a mishmash. We had a lot of skepticism from property owners. What do you mean, US EPA? Oh, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't see what I have. You know, I'm sure, Patty, you've dealt a lot with that. You know, here I am, DEP, I'm knocking on your door. It's like, go away. You know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna answer. And one thing Marvin would call it, he calls it a kaleidoscope of purpose. Remember those? I don't, I don't know. Are some of you young enough to understand you know, what a kaleidoscope is? You know, they gave it to us and it was just a bunch of what? Colors of nothing. You know, it was like ink blobs. So, you know, this is what we were dealing with. Um, you know, we were just meeting for the sake of, of having a meeting with each other. So, you know, we, we kind of floundered around but one thing happened in 2009, we began to experience what we call economic churn. All of a sudden, you know, we had a hundred years of industrial steel and iron making and everything that spun off of that. Weirton Steel at one time employed 13,000 people. You know, they employed parts of Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, you know, parts of uh, West Virginia. Willing Pittsburgh Steel employed 12,000 people. Just in Mingo Junction alone, it was a small community of 4,500 people. They had 6,000 workers that made steel. And in 1970, there were people that made six figures. And the village had a 2% wage tax. They had to be one of the richest villages in the state of Ohio. But what did we do? We spent it. Did we spend it with a purpose? Well, everybody had a job. What happened in 2009 to 2014? All of a sudden, it was all gone. There were auctions. So Willing Pittsburgh had an auction. We still had an auction. Bankruptcy came in. New people moved in. We had no idea where to go. But one place we did understand is the Northern Brownfield Assistance Center began to organize itself. Just about in that same time period, uh, there was a site up in the north. And Pat, I remember Patrick Kirby showing up. And he was going to clean up this pottery site called TS and T. And somebody in the crowd said, "Young man, three governors were here. They couldn't do anything for us. What makes you so important?" And Patrick said, "Well, the fourth governor sent me here. Came up with a check for what about thirty five hundred dollars? I think it was five thousand five thousand dollars. He had a check." So they did some community development, a lot of what you heard about just previously here. What also was starting to go on is, is the BDC was starting to organize itself in a better fashion. Weirton is a classic mill town. Everything depended on Weirton Steel. You know, it was always at the point where there was never a B&O tax in the city of Weirton because if you did, of course, they would be like Mingo Junction, the richest city in, in Weirton. Weirton Steel was once the largest taxpayer in, in the state of West Virginia, one of the largest employers in the state of West Virginia. But that was all gone. There were times when the city would have a gap in the budget and they'd make a call to the CEO of Weirton Steel. How much money you need? Oh, two million dollars. Weirton Steel would write a check for two million dollars. There, there's your gap. Don't do no, don't do that B and O tax. 
That was all gone. They lost heat to the Millsop Center. They they couldn't heat the you know the city building. So what happened is the BDC started to to reorganize itself, and they came up with a master plan. They looked at you know they they hired a contractor that came in from the outside and looked outside the snow globe, you know because you know you turn it around you get a lot of churn in that snow globe, right? But they saw it from a clear picture. And at the same time at BHJ, we took on a freight study to try to understand, you know, where have we been in the past? Where are we going to go in the future? So we were taking an inventory of, of, of the community, of the economic community, and the BDC was, was looking at those different sites and, and trying to figure out where the priorities are. And at the same time, Jefferson County was, was creating what's called a port authority, their side of an economic development authority. So as we started to go through, we had change in executive directorship at my place. Somehow somebody thought it was a good idea to make me executive director. And at the same time, you know, Pat Ford had left at one point, but he was still there. And we got together and we decided, let's go talk to Region 5. I think Mr. Novak helped facilitate some of that. It was a Brownfield conference up in Chicago, I believe. And we had this strange idea that we wanted to do, you know, region three, region five, we wanted to do one application between two separate regions. So we had to decide who was going to be the lead. Well, somebody pointed the finger at me and they said, you're going to lead this. And I said, sure, why not? Let's be open-minded about it, right? So we successfully had a 16 grant. We applied for a 2017 grant. We awarded it. 2019 grant was another one the BDC was awarded. BHJ, we came up with another one at, at 2020. You know, we've we've done some great work. Mr. Novak told me when I was doing the application and the proposal, he said, you know, don't worry about it. I know what you folks are like. You know, he was very encouraging as part of the coalition. And so was so was Patrick Kirby. So, you know, we we know we knew we had somebody behind our back and we started to have a purpose. And eventually it it led to, you know, uh, where we were with these coalition grants. You know, and it's always something that we say you can't spend the you, you can't do a project and you can't spend the money if you don't have it. So, you know, it, we 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 started to look at you know so here we are 20 years later and we built an inventory of what 52 52 sites we've been able to go through the uh, west virginia vrp we i think we have still two outstanding sites but we have five seven seven, seven certificates of completion um, if you understand, you know, what's going on in Weirden with the frontier properties, you know, we've been seeing, you know, a lot of redevelopment, you know, the frontier group was, was somebody that swooped down and bought up some of these places in the auction. The BDC themselves were able to amass some dollars and take over some site control of places. If you were on the tour yesterday, we visited the beach bottom plant was one of them. And now it's turning into a very viable industrial site, but it's taken 10 to 15 years to watch all this mature itself. Those first two coalition grants got us through the process. It was until that third coalition grant that we start to see, you know, these things starting to mature. As, as part of it. And later, you know, I'll be happy to take some questions on that. And if you 
start looking at this, I changed the, the scroll and now it's bonded by the Ohio River. Because if you noticed yesterday when we went up and down the Ohio River, that's the economic center. That's the engine of where we work. Here, I didn't want to take over. No, go ahead. One more? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. This is kind of a theme that we use. You know, people say we're lucky. Well, luck happens when you have opportunity. We prepared. And I think somebody at EPA gave us the cat picture. I, I can't remember. <laughs> He's not in here. Back written all over. <laughs> nope, Joe didn't send that to us. <laughs> we got that? That'll work? That'll work. Okay. Okay, so I work for Bellomar Regional Council, and we, like BHJ, are one of 11 regional councils in West Virginia. We are directly south of BHJ, so we cover Ohio County, Marshall County, Wetzel County, and then, like BHJ, we also have a county in Ohio, so we have Belmont County. Um, and our total population is around 155,000 people. And we have, have three fairly large cities. Um, Wheeling is the largest city and has about 28,000. And then we have a bunch of smaller communities that range in size between a couple hundred to a couple thousand. Um, and like Region 11, we also had a very industrial past. Um, there was a lot of coal mining. There still is coal mining. There's multiple computers. We're too fancy now. <laughs> um, it's, my, it's my fault. So we also had a lot of industry. We had dealing steel. There was a lot of glass made around here. We had the B&O Railroad. We had a lot of tobacco products made. And Wheeling is really famous for their nails, um, the little bell cut nail plant. Um, and once this industry started to, to decline in around the 50s, you know, the population declined, we were left with a lot of abandoned brownfield sites and also a lot of buildings. And like Mayor Elliott said earlier, a lot of our buildings, unfortunately, have a lot of asbestos in them. And so our brownfield program... <laughs> our brownfield program is pretty new. We started in 2019 with an assessment grant, um, just the community-wide assessment grant. And we were able to get a couple phase one assessments done. We did several asbestos assessments, one giant phase two assessment, one reuse plan. And we also did a lot of community outreach. Our um, environmental consultants were able to talk to a lot of people in the community and kind of just get them started with the whole brownfield process. Um, and we did really well spending down that money. So by the time in a few years, we were able to apply for another grant. And we thought, well, why not apply for a little more money? We'll go for the coalition grant. So we decided to apply in 2021 for the Brownfield Assessment Coalition Grant. Um, and with that grant, you need partners. So we partnered up with Wheeling Heritage and Wheeling Heritage is one of 55 national heritage areas in the United States. And they really focus on preservation in downtown Wheeling. They do a lot of programming. Um, so they were kind of the experts for downtown Wheeling and that's where a lot of our sites were happening. So we knew that they would be a good partner. And then we also wanted to have a partner on our Ohio sides, so we partnered up with the Port Authority, like you all did. Um, and then we had our Bella, Bellamar Brownfield Task Force, which consisted of local community members too. So they were always there to help gather input. And we've been working on this grant for the past two years, and we've already completed two phase one assessments, three phase two assessments, a lot of community outreach, a lot of asbestos. We, I think we've done about six asbestos assessments and we've done three reuse plans. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Justin. Great. Thanks, Natalie. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jesse Day. I'm the Regional Planning Director for the Piedmont Tribe Regional Council in uh, Central North Carolina. Um, um, and so our region is uh, uh, an old textile furniture heritage region, right? So you think of North Carolina is really growing fast, right? So yes, our urban centers are growing like gangbusters, but we still have a lot of rural small towns that are, are struggling. Of our 75 member governments and 1.7 million population, which is the majority of two counties, so 10 counties around it are, are much lower in population. With 42 towns that are under 10,000, and so um, there are a series of mill towns, not as large as you know, three, four thousand employees or 10,000 employees that uh, Mike was talking about earlier. A lot of 10, 20 acre small textile mills. Our rivers are not barge ready. <laughs> they're smaller. So you had some smaller textile mill development. So um, just giving you a sense of the economy there. And then with NAFTA, that's what, you know, that time period, late 90s, early 2000s, that really put a, a, a damper on uh, the, the textile and furniture companies. It's starting to, to rebirth, which is, which is good news. Um, but, you know, at that time, or around 2000, it really started, the economy started to shift. Um, and and similarly, a lot of these small towns were, you know, their economy was the the, the local mill. Um, so talk a little bit about our our brownfields work in that region. Um, you know, we've we've yeah four EPA assessment grants um, over the over the course of, of those years since 2007. So we've yeah you know, completed those those phase one and phase twos. Um, also worked on some underground source tank removals um, in, in collaboration with the state. Um, so that's been that's been very successful. I think they've ranged from about three hundred thousand to six hundred thousand or so, and you know the names have changed over the years from community wide to coalition and you know various names of that that nature. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about a new program that we've we've started in just a second. So I've got the screen, paper, and the remote to deal with here. So, um, so forgive me. Um, so, you know, Mike talked about this, but if you're in a small community, you've got a new grant and it kind of just started. How many people have a fresh new grant in the audience? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, you know, think of you know, be broad with your partnerships. Like, you know, there's there's lots of different roles that that honestly these different entities are eager to uh, take on, right? So um, that's what we're, we're paid to do at, at our different roles. So, um, you know, thinking of the federal role, obviously the funding is, is key, but also, you know, the technical assistance provider can bring some training. We're working with our um, technical assistance provider. We're in a separate region, region four. And so we're working with Atlanta, right? So, um, but they, they have a technical assistance provider that's actually going to be out of New Jersey, but, that's that's neither here nor there, but they're they're willing to come down and do whatever kind of training. So we're scheduling um, we're scheduling that uh, sometime later this fall, um, kind of Brownfields one on one to get that education level up. It's just not intuitive what this what this program is about. Obviously, from the state perspective, you know you've got you know the regulatory uh, charge that the state you know ours is the Department of Environmental Quality. North Carolina is charged with that regulation side, but uh, they were a huge partner in coming up with underground storage sites. These are folks that are just like, well, we're we're not going to pay the twenty five thousand dollars to you know deposit to get rid of this. And okay, you've got free money, sure, yeah, we'll we'll talk to you. So we were able to tackle some long standing sites uh, in in collaboration with the state. Um, you know, our our uh, you know regional council of government is a huge huge asset for the small towns is 42 towns that have are under 10,000 population. The manager is doing the economic development, he's doing the current planning, he's doing the day-to-day -day admin, um, he or she, and so they just don't have time to, to work on these, getting these resources together. So uh, so that's where we stepped in, you know, several years ago and, and started to kind of to pull our coalition together. Um, and then I, I want to give a shout out to the environmental consultants because they, they can really explain this stuff so much better than me or Natalie or Mike. Well, not to take any away from you guys, but you know, they, they know the ins and outs uh, of, of the kind of the nuanced regulations and, and whatnot when 
push comes to shove, push comes to shove on certain things. So, so you know, we um, I'm going to go to the next slide. We worked with multiple consultants when we had our assessment grants so that we could cover a bigger area, have you know um, different levels of expertise and resources and a deeper bench. And so that was really helpful because they can explain that, that ours is called the North Carolina Brownfields Program, but it's the you know your voluntary uh, remediation program here in West Virginia. We had a we had a project um, as a, um, a mill in, in Burlington. They're trying to do some green manufacturing. And it was really hard to explain the, the benefits of the voluntary cleanup program. So the uh, environmental consultant that we had at the time brought them in and, and really broke down the liability protection, the tax credit benefit, that, those sorts of things that I think was really helpful for getting them into the program, which you know helps that helps out that flexibility as you remediate your, your site. So um, already hit on the small towns. Uh, and so, yeah, just, I think that the, the the key is to work with all those different partners. Make sure you 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 um, uh, really ask them to to contribute and participate and communicate. Um, let's see. I'm going to move on to the next one here and uh, talk a little bit about sort of what our program. So we have this program up until uh, until 2021. Um, and decided we really wanted to do a cleanup fund. Actually, this is the third time we're having a loan cleanup fund. Um, but we saw a strong connection of our region with uh, Southern Virginia, uh, Martinsville and Danville are the cities that are in that brown region, the West Street Branch Planning District Commission, um, and also the government, which is kind of the Raleigh Durham area. Um, funding for a, a revolving loan fund, but we've got, you know, housing, transportation, uh, economic connections, uh, and similar small, you know, mill towns in the, in that Virginia area. And the idea is, to, you know, make this a long-term program, you know, instead of our 12 counties, let's look at these 23 counties, because we want to set this up for the long-term, uh, make sure that we've got enough projects to, to go out and, and work on cleanup. So, our state's got assessment dollars now from EPA, so we're able to tackle some of the assessment work um, with, with those resources um, and really focus on these, these cleanup of these sites uh, across the region. Um, and I think that's that's the it for my yeah. slides at this point. So I think we're gonna move to uh, some audience participation and some questions. Oh, no, um, I wanted to ask. Just pass the mic a little bit. Yeah, but... <laughs> there were three of you are going to have a current grant right now. Is that correct? Who has current grants? Yes. Okay. Who is planning on applying for a grant? Okay. You're planning on applying for one? How big is your organization? Well, uh, I <laughs> Relatively <laughs> large. We just got our first uh, uh, assessment grant, uh, two million dollar grant that we're you know will be awarded by the first we get the money. Um, but yeah, we're, I I I wanted to send a session to try to get an idea of how. That works from this point forward. I mean, we've got a plan in place, but it's um, it's not getting the right people in the right spot. Sure. Yeah, so that's a good question. Yeah, the reason I ask that is our organization is a very small organization. Yeah, yeah. 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 Conditions outside of our organization that have major effect on us. Those things are like the, the moon's effect on the earth, gravitational influences. So you have to have a mass built around you that will not have any direct effect on what your purpose is. And that to create that mass, you have to build this coalition. You have to have partners that give you buffer, partners that will give you some, like Mike said, protect your back, that's US EPA. But as community organizations, it is the organizations that are around your particular, the characteristics around your particular area. If you build that coalition around them, 
<clears throat> it'll give you a, a mass that will allow you to perform, to create a scenario that you'll accomplish your purpose. That's why I was asking about who has what. Questions? Sorry. All right. I have some prefab questions, but is this one not working either? That's fine. I can talk loud, but I'm worried about the people on the. Hello, that's Are they picking me up? Okay, great. So I have some questions, but does anybody have any questions in the audience before we I'll get us warmed up a little bit? Figuratively speaking, still don't have any heat. Shane? Yeah. Work a lot with, with regional coalitions and issues. One of the things uh, I see a lot of formal partners that I would call sort of federal, state, local elected officials. We also experience uh, what I'll say partisan and political shift every election cycle. And I'm always cautious about uh, relying on those leaders to drive these long-term projects. And, and I also see a lot of sort of outreach. And, and when I'm working with communities, I see outreach as sort of one-way engagement, one, one-way sort of delivery of information, education. But I'm wondering what role sort of real community engagement plays where a community uh, people who are, are there, multi-generation residents and families, helps form or shape these plans and the vision. Um, and does that is that coming in through the consultants? Uh, is that sort of by the coalitions? Um, I'd love to, to sort of hear more about how community is driving the reuse vision and some of this planning, because it, it really seems like in, in our in our experience. When we can move from sort of education and outreach to community engagement to ownership, we're seeing a lot more sort of vibrancy, uh, a lot more energy around moving these things forward. Okay. How I how I would answer that is the the sites that we deal with are are a bit different. You know, we're we're dealing more with industrial sites that we are reinvigorating. So in other words, what's happening is we're working with the entities that have site control or the BDC themselves have the site control. So we're working with, say in, in Jefferson County, Ohio, it's a company called JSW Steel. So we're working directly with the steel maker or we're working with an ancillary company that supplies scrap to that steel maker. And in his case, he owns a site in Beach Bottom, West Virginia, and he's working with the other people that are looking, the prospects that are coming in. And that is same that's true with the old Weird and Steel site. There's a company called the Frontier Group, and, and they have you know, about 1,100 acres that we parsed out by, by um, um, they're, they're called CAAs. And, and uh, I, doesn't, I, I can't remember what it's, it's, it's little areas, those action areas that we work with. And we're entering each of those into the VRP. So where we start engaging the community is, is through, just through the media outlets. So in other words, we're showing the media outlets, hey, you know, you know, the one is what you're seeing here at Form Energy. All of a sudden they found, you know, this through the state of West Virginia and through the Economic Development Office. So this is how we're engaging the community now. It's like, you know, we're bringing in, you know, several hundred million dollars of investment. So it's it's kind of like the community comes in in the back end because we're dealing with these large industrial sites as opposed to you know creating community spaces. One project that we did work with in Jefferson County was a dry cleaners. And if you've done anything with dry cleaners, you know that you know after 30, 40, 50 years. So it's it's more of it's just that little area there that we've worked with with that. And I'm going to ask if Jeff, Jesse or Natalie has anything to add to that. Um, I was just going to say we have 
a gun don't don't have course, which I think has been really helpful in engaging our community. And because we have four counties, we wanted to make sure that we had representatives from each county and some of the communities. And we really relied on them to kind of speak to their own community and bring that information back to us. Yeah, I was gonna show a slide here um, on a project. So this is a interested to your point, Shane, you know, in terms of involving the community. Um, and one thing I'll mention too is, is you, if you have an EPA assessment base, you have some funding in there with area-wide planning that can be really useful uh, to hire, you know, bring in a consultant, you know, at the regional council level, you know, we may want to do that work ourselves, but we can also bring in some extra resources. So if you don't have an area wide plan, but you need this sort of this planning, you know, look to your regional council as well. Um, but this particular site, um, it's one of those, I, I, during this morning's talk, I forget the lady from Tennessee talking about the, you know, the 10 year site. This is the, our 10 year site in our region, small mill town, 2000 people, everybody on their, their town board worked at this mill at one time or another, or, or their mom did or their sister. Um, and so, uh, so the town actually spent some, some dollars, uh, you know, working on a, a site master site plan, which I, I don't have the visuals for that, but just trying to re rethink the purpose. Fortunately, a developer came in, de demolished this whole building, took all the copper out and left a pile of rubble for the town and said, here, have the property. And it's in a floodplain. And so it's a major it's gateway to town. You see that bridge in the bottom of the road. That's kind of as you come into town off I-73 um, as you're going to Virginia. Um, so we're, we had, it found PCBs and I did do a targeted brownfields assessment. So some of that master plan stuff is, is yet to be launched, but you know, once that's complete and, and the, the plan for that, those PCBs are, are addressed, you know, maybe we can put that, that master plan to work, uh, which will include a lot of trails and recreation because two thirds of the sites in, in a, in a floodplain, you couldn't build that mill today um, with, with the regulations. So. I'd like to add one more thing. Mike hit upon it briefly, but in our situation with our coalition, we've had changeovers in executive directors of the BHJ, the BDC, and Jefferson County Board Authority. We've gone through how many elections of county commissioners and city Over city managers. Twenty years worth. Yeah, we've gone through all of those changes that everybody has to go through on the political side. But we've made, been able to maintain our course because we built some integrity in the system with having the outreach program and also getting the community involved. And we were able to, when you have site control, it helps out a lot. If you get any piece of property that you're working on, if you can get site control through wherever means are available to you, that's an important component because all of the people that are elected officials will want to get on the bandwagon and you have the ability to put the platform together for them to stand up and say, rah, rah, we've accomplished something. They like to have the platform. We often call undeniable uh, success. And, <laughs> and, and we do that in spite of a lot of elected officials. But, uh, yes, very much so. Yeah. That's right. Well, and I would say, I think I've done a lot of work with the BDC since I started in Brownfields. and. Um, we have done, there's, they, there's a lot more community engagement happening once there's a site identified for cleanup. There's quite a bit even and beyond what's required by the EPA. And so that's what a lot of times what the Brownfield Center supports. And I would say it was those three M's that brought, really brought us to Chester, um, three women who live right next to it, yep. who all happen to have M names. So we affectionately called them the three M's, um, <laughs> who were watching pretty close all the cleanup activities at the site to make sure everything went the way they expected it to go. Um, and, and that's just an example, but I think, and we did, we've done a lot of really creative things up in the panhandle, Brooklass. um, at Brook Glass, we've done some, like some fun events. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's where they've got sort of the formal representation on the task forces. And then kind of, once you get a specific project, you get kind of closer to the ground. And I think part of it too was, you know, uh, the political entities have become aware of what we're doing. And they've kind of like said, geez, like Marvin said, integrity. They kind of they kind of back off and just let us do what we do. You know, and and you know, one of our county commissioners is an attorney. 
So he handles estates. And, and in one instance, you know, he was handling, he was trying to work with a, a property owner for a, a client of his to buy some property, but they were going through an estate sale. You know, everybody's done with, and they had to dissolve these, these corporations. It was a trucking company. They had a, we were talking about this last night, they had 10,000 gallon tank out there now. And DEP at first was not going to let us spend the EPA dollars because we have to go through that process to get their allowable in order for us to spend petroleum dollars. Okay. But after about two weeks, they looked into the estate and they figured out there's no money there. So then they just came back to us. You guys do what you got to do. So, you know, in the end, we didn't pull the tanks out, but we did do the phase ones, the phase twos, you know, on the properties to identify everything that was there. We probably spent about twenty five, thirty thousand dollars doing that. The estate felt comfor comfortable with that because now they had somebody that was going to buy the property. So he paid for the tank pool. Otherwise, if we weren't there to interject, I think those tanks would still be in the ground. And then what that also led to over on the Ohio side, the trucking company had land next to the steel plant. So then they felt comfortable working with us through the coalition that we went through phase one, phase two, and helped them do some purchase and demolition of property and repurposing. So yeah, it goes back to integrity, you know, because at first it was what? Skepticism, you know, so. So keep thinking of your questions. I'm gonna uh, throw one out. What, let's start with Natalie. What would you say has surprised you the most in this work, good and or bad? Um, I would say, just the time that it takes to do the assessment and the whole brownfield process. Um, I guess I was not prepared for that. I think you kind of want to see some instant results and this is definitely not a field of instant results. Um, they take years and even when, even just doing a phase one or phase two assessment, I mean, they started, our consultants started right in 2021 and they're still working on some of the phase two work and it probably won't even be finished during this grant like we will have run out of money so for me I was really surprised just the timeline and how long it takes I think what about you surprises um let's see I think uh yeah uh that's a that's a good question um I wrote down all the other questions you had. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can email. What surprised you most is this question. Yeah. <laughs> the, the interesting thing, um, I don't know if it's a surprise, but it's just kind of the a, a success piece is just the, once you can get past the education part about this, I, that's that's one of those challenges is once you can get past that, just the the way champions will come come out and, and lead their community forward and take ownership. Um, but getting to that point is 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 challenging, right? So I think that's that's a, a neat surprise is that once you can kind of get everybody educated, what however that takes, whether it's a planning process or it's you know key meetings with elected officials or a combination of those two, um, you know, once you get past that, that the, the community will run with that. Um, your environmental consultant will be there alongside. And so, um, yeah, so that, that's what I would, how I would answer that question. Thank you, Marvin or Mike. This is going to be contradictory somewhat. Uh, how fast do, how fast things do happen? Uh, I started in 2004 and you, so I'm surprised that all of the things we've accomplished in that span of time. It takes a little bit of patience, it takes persistence, but you'd be very surprised how quickly those things can happen. How fast, uh, I'll, I'll refer to Anna, when the first time she came on their site, it's TSMT, and the stage that we are now with the TSMT site, it seemed like a long time, but it wasn't. It was not a long time. Um, you will be very surprised once you get into the process, once you get the steps going, 
once you get a little bit of a team effort into there, you'll have some people coming in and going out. You'll have some caterpillars that move around all the time, and you'll have the pillars of the organization will maintain the integrity of that organization throughout the process. You'd be very surprised at how quickly that happens. It will be a very satisfying process. Um, Juan knows all about that. He's been through many of them. Other questions? I have some more. Yeah. So the other slide shows that um, they have a multi-level tier, multi-tiers for the coalition. One of those was state, and I prefer the office grant. So in, in your experience, what was the, the best thing or the most important things at the state level it's brought to the table to help projects uh, in it. And, and... I, I would say encouragement. And this is what I tell my young men that, that or young women to die higher is that everyone wants you to succeed. No one wants to see you fail. And I think if from a surprise point of view, you know, here I come from a whole completely different background, you know, 30 years ago into where I am now working with government. And, you know, in my past experience, it was like government always interfered. Now I'm part of it, you know, and it's just the fact that every, everyone and sincerely wants you to succeed and they give you every from the federal and state, and I mean from from Ohio to West Virginia to Pennsylvania, you know, everyone. I think that's that's the key to it all. You know, that's that's been my experience. Now, once you get down more into the local level, you know, being that I'm a resident and a lifelong resident of the Steubenville, Ohio, Weird in West Virginia area. You know, I've sometimes I had a I had a young I had a fellow a little older than me that worked with us and we used to call ourselves Jesus of Nazareth. Who are you, the son of you know, the carpenter? You know, we, we gotta go outside and hear it. So that you know, sometimes the people at the local level need to hear it from somebody that's two hundred miles away. You know, so that's some and then sometimes that's what happens. The state people come in and completely reiterate what you have said. And that goes back to that credibility. Yeah, I think the only other thing I'd add, again, particularly in North Carolina, these people have been real in the staff in the program. And so I think having some mutual respect of that and, and patience. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think to Mike's point, I mean, you, your local communities want to, want to succeed. So, Looking, you know, trying to bridge that partnership gap with local and regional partners, I think they'd be more than willing to step in and, and help with that communication piece uh, and whatever whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. But you know, starting with that communication of what 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 kind of resources you're bringing, um, utilize those local and regional partners. Anything else on that one? All right. Um. So. Other than the state, the, uh, you have your great, who's part of your coalition? And we've talked a little bit about the community engagement piece, but who are the key stakeholders to engage throughout this process? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start sure. off and then we'll go. We'll go. Um, I think, uh, you know, presentation of real estate associations, uh, you know, there may be some industrial, you know, industrial coalitions as well. Um, that's where we've had a lot of success in terms of getting the word out on on kind of our program because um, they're the you know the real estate folks are working with different you know they've got maybe representing commercial properties or residential or or a combination thereof so that's that's been really helpful uh, for us in terms of getting our our message out and, and getting buy into our coalition. Yeah, and we have, with our task force, we have mayors, uh, city managers, we have our local economic development authority is on our um, task force. We have real estate representatives, a representative from West Banco, which is our largest bank. 
and um, like the Belmont County Community Corporation as well, and the Port Authorities. We don't have an extensive group like that. We have just our coalition members, which are three, and each one of those has its own individual board, individual governing body. And those bodies consist in Jefferson County, County Commissioners, both the Port Authority, uh, with the the BHJ, they are the, the cities within the metropolitan organ, organizations area. And those would be both in West Virginia and Ohio. Those organizations pay dues to belong to the MPO. So they are participants with the MPO and Mike would be the representative for them on our coalition. The BDC has its own private board or a private nonprofit organization. And we have banks, companies, and individuals. Also, uh, the cities, if they elect, they can be me members or they're paying members, just like on the MPO. And the uh, county commissioners participate. So there is a vocal point from each avenue that has the ability to feed our coalition. But we filter that information. We don't get involved with all of the particulars of a particular in an individual community unless they ask us to. And if you funnel that information down to a core group of individuals, those that core group can accumulate sites, build an inventory, and uh, tap into the resources that are necessary to accomplish the remediation or the assessment of the properties. And I would say doing it as a small group, you know, people are aware of what we're doing. So if we have an elected official or a property owner or what have you come to us for assessment, our first impulse is going to be, what's your end game? What, what are you trying to accomplish at the end of the day? Is it you building a business? Or are you just doing a transaction? You know, those types, you know, we, we want to have a purpose to the end of it. We want to be able to leverage other dollars, either state dollars, private dollars, what have you. You know, we, we don't want to get into the situation that we're at the end of a grant and we just want to spend the money for the sake of spending it, you know. So, you know, we've, we've had to turn away, you know, a few projects in the past because sometimes you get resistance. I've had lawyers call me up and they want to do a phase one or a phase two on a property. And then the other person that's transacting with them is like, we don't want, you know, these assessments done. So we got to walk away. You know, that's, that's just part of how it works. I would add that um, it's important to engage with property owners early and often as you're building that inventory to dispel some of those like misconceptions about what it means to assess their property or what it means that their name, their properties on your list, um, as well as EPA is incredibly involved in all of the grants that they award. And so they're, I mean, when I used to come to the coalition meetings, Joe's usually there at the quarterly meetings in person. Um, so I think it's important to keep them engaged throughout as well. That's just what I would add on. Oh. Other questions from the audience? Christian? Yeah, Bail me out. <laughs> and that's all he's at liberty to say at this time. That's all we're all liberty to say at this time. If you talk about coalitions, I'd be interested to hear uh, if the local health department and or a local nonprofit hospital is engaged. And then I'll put in a plug for a second later. With with one that was the dry cleaners that we had, definitely had the public health department involved with that. Um, there was some indoor monitoring that had to be done in, in residential areas. You know, that was one that, that had to be engaged in that one. I didn't know, Natalie, you probably have a story to tell about a hospital, right? Um, I mean, the health department wasn't involved necessarily, but one of our big projects is we had a local community hospital that closed its doors in 2019. And so the city purchased the property um, and we used our assessment grant to do all the asbestos assessment. And 
you know, a lot of people in the city just didn't think that anything was going to happen with that site, but WVU Health came in and they want to build a cancer center. So, yeah, and that, I mean, and, and this site was massive. There were are like seven buildings um, and they were, they're old and, you know, we didn't really think anything was going to happen there. And a lot of people, like the mayor was saying, was that the city was, people in the city were upset that the city purchased the property and took control of it. But in the end, it ended up working out. Um, but in five years, there should be a cancer center that will have a regional impact. Yeah, there, there should be a slide. Yeah, so go ahead, tell our story. Tell the story. Looks like. Um, yeah, can I ask? All the carbon tax didn't do a lot of stuff to help me stuff with non and address priority health issues in the community. And these we'll talk about that later. So, <laughs> <laughs> very great. We show you how to get into your local hospitals, help meet the stuff and figure out what their priorities are, figure out a way to match up. So, not just Redeveloping an old abandoned hospital site, but um, but also redeveloping the hospital. And they could part. do a lot more things than you would think. And yeah. Christian will tell you all about it. But like Mary Hunt used to always say, like Duke Hospital is building sidewalks. Like you can yeah, do hospital. lots of things. Uh, anyway, go see Christian at three fifteen. Well, I would say too, in um, Wheel and Grow OB, yeah, they they interact. I know with um, with public health officials and school officials and everything. They have a pretty good coalition together with what they're trying to do. Are you working with your hospital foundations or the hospital itself? The hospital, so okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Part of the ACA. Community benefit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we haven't done that in postpartum. Uh, part of a reuse plan as a part of justification for grants, it becomes mm -hmm. sort of a Driven community yeah. Input, you know, sure. But that's a great point. When you're writing your assessment grant, you've got to talk about is your plan a part of a revitalization plan? And you might traditionally look at the SEDS, which is from your regional planning and development councils, but there may be a, a community health needs assessment that you could also point to. Yeah. And what Christian's not telling you is that he's written a lot of them. <laughs> Christian writes them, so he knows a lot about it. <laughs> We've used the assessment as part of a as a tool to go towards our proposals. Yeah. Yeah, we have used those and and have engaged, you know, some of the upper management and you know in the medical field to get their feedback from that. And that's where we get some of the statistics that we use in there. Just as a as an off subject, you know, at, at my office, you know, we also do transportation planning. We're also involved with active transportation. So, you know, we've been part of that, you know, community assessment as well. Any other questions? All right. Um, I think I'm going to do two more. Uh, what would you say has been your biggest lesson? <laughs> Patience and persistence. Well, that's what my mother always taught me, and that's pretty much it. You know, patience and persistence and learning to let go in, in some instances, you know, because sometimes you get a project that you really want to do, but you, you, you get resistance. But somehow those things come back around to you, you know, in three, five years, some things change. So, you know, I've, I've, that's, that's one lesson that, that I had to learn that it'll come back. You know, um, I would say that not every site ends up <laughs> being what you thought it was going to be. <laughs> it doesn't follow the um, the route that you thought it was going to take. One of our sites, you know, we used a lot of our coalition money to pay for reuse planning, and they did a lot of outreach with that. And we just found out that they still maybe didn't talk to the community as well as they should have and that the community has some issues with what they were doing. So they have to go out and do their own outreach more. So it's, I think you have this vision of what things are gonna end up as, but it's it doesn't always happen that way. 
Uh, on similar response, it's thanks for being last, but it's like the same. So, uh, <laughs> I think also just there's so many resources out there. Um, it's easy to get kind of distracted with all this public money. So I think trying to stick to a strategy and, and a plan is valuable. Does that always happen? No, but um, trying to get back to that strategy is, I think, a lesson. Um, that we've learned, uh, and that's gen that's a little more general than specific to this 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 project. But working in local government, we're we're real under resourced and always trying to ch chase those resources. But I think sticking to strategy is a lesson. All right, my last question, and you can use this to segue if you have slides to answer it, um, is to tell us about your biz biggest success, and we'll let Jesse start this. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, let me highlight a, a project here, I think. Um, and so, um, you know, prefacing that with, um, um, I think just just generally around our coalition, I'll talk a little bit about the story, is... Uh, uh, they were working. I think uh, work over, you know, 10, 15 years on, you know, four assessment grants is really... Uh, pointed us in a direction of, of setting up this this multi-state RLS coalition. So, not success yet. I think having the framework there is it, it was a year. You know, we've been less than a year in on the RLS grant, and so um, hopefully we can that can be a, a future success. But this is an, an interesting project I wanted to show you. The first slide, yeah. Oops, apologies. Um, is uh so this this town of Thomasville similar size to Wheeling well historically is smaller but uh, it's about twenty five thousand population um, southwest of High Point in Greensboro um, and yeah I believe in that there um, this this uh, building is not a huge site again I remember we have smaller uh, smaller mills than than what um, you have up this way but uh, this old textile mill town or excuse me furniture mill. Thomasville Furniture Company basically had they had they had this is plant L they had plant A B C a, a bunch of different ones around town so they kind of built that up and again with NAFTA everything just just went belly up and all that it went offshore and you'll still see the name Thomasville Furniture out there but it doesn't it's not built here anymore um, but the city was going to tear this this mill down and turn it into a um, into a police station. And, you know, we had our Brownfields assessment program probably about 10 years ago when I first started talking with them and talked to the city manager, like, well, maybe, yeah, maybe we can look at that. And there's a, there's a key part of the coalition. We got a developer, kind of a forward-minded developer, third wave housing um, that that wanted to turn this this mill into a multifamily uh, affordable housing unit. So uh, in North Carolina, we had a, of course you have historic tax credits, uh, but also had um, affordable tax credits on this. And then we have a mill, uh, a mill tax credit. So we're able to kind of stack that into the project. Even before development, there's about 55 full dumpsters of, of stuff to pull out of this because it was you know, sitting fallow for, for a, dec a decade or so. Um, and this is kind of what it turned into um, on, the, on the site and uh, into 139 units. Um, <laughs> affordable housing. So you're like, gosh, that's great. 750 bucks a month. <laughs> I think one of the challenges I'll just add with this this project um, is that a lot of folks that are not income qualified would love to live here, but they can't because they need 100% affordable units. So if you can figure out how to mix those, those kind of those rents together, I think that makes a, a much more successful multifamily project. But honestly, a lot of our mill redevelopment projects turn into to housing. We have uh, a huge housing shortage. We've done analysis for our region. We're about 58,000 units short, 10 years. So we've got to catch up. Um, we're starting to build build those, but again, that's only in our city centers where you're getting those units. In our, our rural areas where they're also needed, we don't we don't have those. Um, um, but yeah, so that, that's a, just a little kind of story from from our region that I wanted to share. So. I think our greatest success is going to be the cancer hospital. Um, it did, I think it was kind of scary at the beginning to give this assessment money because it 
it's obviously seven buildings and it's a huge property. And we had Patty, she's our environmental consultant, to just kind of give us an estimate of, okay, what is an assess uh, asbestos assessment going to cost? And it was a lot of money. It was a huge chunk of our coalition grant to focus on one property. So I thought it was kind of risky, but just knowing that, you know, we kind of, the city wasn't very open with, hey, what is going to be the end use? We didn't really know it was going to be a hospital, but we just kind of trusted their, their um, I don't know, what we just trusted what their belief was for this site. So, and now it's going to end up being a really amazing place. I think it's going to have a huge impact economically, not on, just on Wheeling, but all our surrounding communities as well. It will take five years to build them, so <laughs> we have to wait. <laughs> we'll come back in five years. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say our beach bottom site, although it, it's there's more investment in another site we're working on right now, but the beach bottom site was a site that was a, a structure was supposed to be torn down originally on the original plans it was supposed to disappear, and. Uh, things happen along the way that you have to change your plans. The person who bought a piece of equipment on the site said, I can't move it. I want to leave it here. Can you, can we stay here? And that altered our, our plan completely from what we originally started with. And from that decision point, <clears throat> we have been able to utilize technical assistance, <clears throat> TBAs, uh, Cleanup grants, coalition assessment grants, revolving loan funding grants, US EDA funds, USDA funds, uh, West Virginia Development Office funds. So on the site, we've spent about $500,000 of US EPA funding, and that has leveraged. Uh, $2.6 million of uh, US EDA money. Private money so far is about 1.2 million. West Virginia Development Authority or De Water Development Authority is 3.5 million. IJDC is 1.9 million. Department of West Virginia Department of Economic Development, 2 million. Uh, a company is coming in putting $9 million in there. The current, the tenant, the one to stay, they put about $16 million into the project, into the site. So we've got about $36 million invested and leveraged from $500,000 of US EPA assessment, cleanup, revolving loan fund, et cetera. Well, that doesn't fit on the slide. <laughs> but all of that in acres, I feel compelled to ask. Uh, on behalf most of, of that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Most of that is. Right. I, think, I think we pretty well captured that. Um, my success is just working with these gentlemen. I mean, you know, I'm basically the the administrator. I'm the one that does the acres and, you know, working with Jacob and 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 getting those things in and just just being, you know, doing something into the community, you know, giving back, so to speak. I think I think that's my success and what I'm most proud of. You know, we've been able in Jefferson County, we have a very active land bank, you know, the land bank. We, we destruct a lot of property, but, you know, we, we're starting to see some more reconstruction from there. I mean, you know, uh, you, you get the opportunity when you do these, when you do these, these PAQs, when you first get into there, you know, to show EPA where you want to spend the money. So you learn a lot about the history of your area. You know, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a really neat part of that. You know, those, those are those, uh, you know, assessment questions that you have to answer before they allow you to spend the money. You know, we found an area in Jefferson County. It was an old mill town that, uh, or coal town that was, you know, about five to 6,000 people used to live there. Now it's gone. And you find out that it was one of the largest coal mines in, you know, eastern United States, and it's gone. And we found a gas station there. And... You know, then one thing led to another, and we're we're close to getting it cleaned up with some state monies in there. But uh, you know, just just doing you know stuff like that, 
you know, is, is, is very satisfying. We have time for one more question, if we have one. Any final thoughts from the panel? They are ready for lunch. Ready for lunch. Huh? I have important lunch <laughs> information. Don't leave before I tell you about lunch. No, we'll <laughs> think it through, you know, it's like we want to set up the most equitable, you know, detailed process to get, you know, funding into every single part of our community. I think that's that's very challenging. And, and so I think having uh, decision makers that can can have that lens of community benefit and equity and stuff like that with maybe a little bit flexibility sort of how you distribute the funds may set you up for more success because I think you can get um, and it may be a little counterintuitive or it may uh, some folks may disagree and I'm happy to talk a little bit more at lunch about it but I think that's one thing we've we've tried to focus on because we've been burned in the past where we set up like well, this is going to be very focused in this one specific area because that's very underserved. And then, yeah, you, know, you get towards the end of the grant, and you've still got a, you, know, you still got some money. So I think trying to leave some flexibility with some broad, important goals around equity and and whatnot is is just one thing. One final thought I'll kind of leave you as if you're setting up a new program in your area. Well, uh, please join. Oh, one more thing on Beach Bond. The city. Beach Bond is only about 500 people, so it's not very big. They built a new playground. How much was it? About $500,000. $500,000. It was all a launch from the tax base created from the Jupiter Aluminum and development for the Beach Bottom site. So they were a little town of 500 people has a the envy. It's the envy yeah, of Brook County. It is. It's, uh, now yeah. Wellsburg wants a playground. You know, so yeah. You know. Very modern, very nice uh, playground, and they have. A, it was nice to go down the other day, drive through on a. I don't. I just did it on a Saturday, and uh, they had a little festival going on. There must have been sixty kids on the playground. So that's that is the. We try to create jobs. That's our purpose to create jobs. The the spin-off from those jobs is the development of the community. All the other things will happen. Retail, uh, the housing, they all come along the way. But it was nice to see 60 young kids in a brand new playground in a town of 500 people. 